So many factors can make a doll a landmark doll. It could be the rarity of the doll. It could be its condition. It could be its provenance. It could simply be the entire presence of that doll when you walk into a room and see it and it just jumps right out at you and you say, that, that doll is so extraordinary. It's a landmark doll. And I'm showing you some of the landmark dolls from the Margaret Lumia collection. I want to start with this funny-faced little boy right here because he is, to our knowledge at this point, one of a kind in the world. And I would be so pleased if someone said, no, I have one too, because then we would know there was another one. And I would be pleased if nobody told me that so we could continue to say this is the only one in the world. It's from the Jumeau 200 art character series that were introduced in the early 1890s. Now these series of dolls were originally done under commission for automaton makers. Remember, they were, the automaton makers were doing funny little vignettes of children, I don't know, running away from a mouse or, or um, playing with their toys or looking at their broken little toy, and that kind of activity. And the automaton makers had this idea, well, why couldn't we have a bisque head on the, on the doll that is doing this mechanical action that would be reflective of the activity that is happening? So they commissioned Jumeau to make this series. Well, Jumeau did, and then after he started making them, he said, well, wait a minute, I've already made the heads now. Why can't I just um, take it and change the neck socket? Now, see, for the automatons, you had to have a flat neck to fit into the mechanism. But for a doll, you want like that light bulb bottom, so it fits into the torso. So that's what Jumeau did. He made a limited number of dolls from his art character series that were designed to be dolls. Well, look at this wonderful face. We love it. It's so rare. It's so fabulous. It's so expressive. It's not really something you'd give to a child to play with. Um, a little too realistic and too expressive. So as dolls, they never really took off, but they were great promotion for Jumeau. Guess what that means today? Really, really rare. It also means, because he made them as exhibition pieces, that they tend to have beautiful quality in their sculpting, in their painting, and they tend to be beautifully preserved because they really weren't played with. Number 219, 219. This model is not shown in the Jumeau book that Francois Taimier and I worked on because there was no known photograph of the doll. So this is the first time it's appearing. Also, in the inventory of SFBJ Jumeau that was done at the end of the century when, when SFBJ took over the Jumeau firm, they did an inventory of how many of each of the art character heads existed still. And there were, oh, I forgot what it was. I think there were, it was either 14 or 40 of these heads only of this model that still existed at that time in about four different sizes. So what happened to them? We don't know. We only know that here is one model 219, and it is a fabulous, expressive face, and you could have a great game um, with who could do the best caption of why is this child crying. In beautiful condition, extraordinarily rare, everything about this is a landmark doll. Right here in the front are two little examples from André Toulier, uh, one of the premier French doll makers of Bebés during the 1880 period, and this is two examples of his work. One with the kid body, that is considered to be a little few years earlier than the other one, a couple years only, um, but with bisque hands and very, very firmly stuffed kid body in beautiful condition with original dress, just in wonderful condition. And the other has the French uh, composition body, so you have to decide which one you like the best or perhaps you'd want two, but they're su it's such a rare doll. They're in such beautiful condition. And this tiny size, wow, you just don't find it. You just don't find it. Let me turn them around so you can see them all the way around. I don't know. I keep looking at them trying to decide which one I like the best, and I, I'm having a hard time doing that. The dolls were uh, previously, for many years, featured in the Mary Merritt Doll Museum in Pennsylvania, and when that, auction, that museum was sold at auction, they were shown on the front cover. So they have a really good provenance with them, too. Another from the Jumeau art character series in a grand large size. This is the model 223 with her um, sort of coquettish smile. 
deep blue paperweight eyes, superb couturiere um, ivory satin costume, including a parasol, including the signed shoes. Everything about her is just absolutely extraordinary. She is a wonderful, wonderful doll and very rare also to find. And now we come on to this side of the room. This is the cover doll for the Landmark Collection. And so much it deserves to be. I went back and looked in all of the almost 50 years of cataloging that we've done. We have had uh, the Jumeau Asian face actually with a particular painting, not just costume to be Asian, but having a very stylized complexion, a distinctive painting of the eyebrows. Um, we've only had this three times. And to find this one in its entirely original costume, wow, once again. You just, it just doesn't happen. So let's turn it around so you can see her all the way around. Lift this up. You can see the wonderful detail of the costume of the skirt. Let me get it a little more further around. There you go. These early silks, they, they're, they're just so luxurious and they're just Nothing compares to them. Look at the front of this, how the, um, the oversewn of the, of the various braid and then that thick metallic, almost like an intertwining that's done on it. And then here is, look, it has the classic sleeves as it should be. And then you can see on the side the way the construction of it is going. It's just a wonderful, wonderful doll. And again, flawless complexion, flawless complexion. Margaret Lumia was fastidious in finding the very best of pieces and so rare and then only in really great condition. If you ever wanted to own a Hooray Bay Bay, this is the one you would want to own because we featured this doll on the front of our calendar, of our 2019 calendar, because there's something about this face. I look at it and I try to describe it and I can't think of any particular words in writing a technical description of it as to why it should have such a presence that it does, but it does. It just is, it's, it's one of those dolls that you say of them as if they might speak, and that's what she looks like. She has such a real look to her. She has a very classic hooray detail of the glaze at the lower part of the eye, eye socket, um, which brings out kind of heightening of the eyes and very deep set sockets with beautiful painting. Her body is all wooden. She's a, she's a wooden hooray bay bay body and a fabulous original costume. Just a superb doll. And finally our handsome gentleman taking, staying guard over everyone else is um, done by Jean Van Rosen who was a Belgian sculptor transplanted to Paris and worked during the um, art movement, the Renaissance um, art movement of the dolls in Paris about the 1914 time period and did a few, not many, her dolls are quite rare, distinctive characters of um, French people. And this one in his original wonderful costume. One of the other factors that I love so much about the Margaret Lumia collection landmark is that she has she has an eye she had an eye for picking out very distinctive and unusual items, um, sometimes to be researched later. Sometimes she knew about them when she bought them, but she just had that instinct. And lucky for us today that we can have them here to show you. What the girl in green that I'm moving to the front of the table is attributed possibly to Brule Cachelieu of Paris, based on a patent that was done by that firm in the early 1860s. Um, it is very unusual. If you were to pick this doll up, the first thing you would say is, wow, that doll is so light, it hardly weighs anything. The reason that's true is the body is made out of a pressed laminated cloth. Very, very unique. Um, gave a lot of flexibility to the body. For example, you could see the, uh, the legs are very flexible, moving back and forth, and that was what the purpose was about. Very distinctive doll, very, very rare to find, and in this case, made even more beautiful because it has a, just a gorgeous face, a very gentle face, quite similar to the Hooray, but without some of the extra detail of painting of the eyes 
I want to turn it around so you can see the back of the bonnet because this bonnet is particularly a gem. And in the catalog, we've shown about four photographs of the naked body in different poses so you can see um, exactly how it was made and how wonderfully easy it was to articulate. See how the hands are easy to move up and down. She's a blue ribbon winner. In 1983, at the 34th annual exhibit of the United Federation of Doll Clubs, she won a blue ribbon, 1983. Okay, I'm gonna put her back and show you a few others. That are some of my favorites from the collection. Um, Margaret Lumia bought these actually from Theriault's some time ago, and it's the pair of the Spanish uh, man and woman in their traditional costumes, original costumes, and unbelievably detailed, absolutely beautiful. Look at the man in particular. You have to look because it's so hard to tell since his hair is black. You have to look at that cap he's wearing with the um, embroidery, the soutache trim, the detail, the looping. I'm going to turn it around so you can see it at the back. I hope the camera is able to pick that up because it kind of blends right into his hair. And what I like about this man is they were putting on, you know, those tight-fitting uh, matador costumes. Well, the only way they thought they could do that and really show it off was they put him on the Jumeau lady body. So he has this tiny waist and his little butt is just perfectly conforms to these wonderful uh, costume of the pants and it's just, it's just fabulous in every way. He has the cape, look at the detail on the shoulder and all the way around. Now, sort of like birds, I guess, his partner is a little more subdued. She's very elegant, but she doesn't have all of the brilliance and gold he does. She does have little rhinestone sequins all over uh, the lace um, tiers of her skirt, and her costume is this extraordinary satin fabric, and you can see a lot of the originality by, by tucking in, by if you pull the gathers apart, you can see the old fading of the fabric. It's just absolutely beautiful. See, she also has the lady body, and the costume is fitted perfectly, perfectly to her. Very, very rare dolls in their original costumes. Let me show you the back of her hair because she has her hair captured in this elongated black woolen snood, which matches uh, the wool drapes on her cape. Fabulous pair of dolls. Extremely rare. Now we have a little gathering of brew bebés over here. And look how each is different. This is really extraordinary. <clears throat> I'm just going to touch briefly on them so you can um, read in detail about them in the catalog and you can see how many variations there were made. When people talk about wanting to have a brew bebe, the big girl is the one they're usually talking about. The very classic, gorgeous bebe with the little tip, tip of the tongue sticking out between the lips. Um, they give it a very um, soulful type of look. And this is an extraordinary example in a rare large size, with beautiful bisque hands. Everything about her is the classic brew that everyone wants. But Brew is a very imaginative guy, and he did a lot of variations, and they are very, very rare to find. And advanced collectors are always looking for them. Another beautiful classic Bebe is the Bebe uh, Model. And what the Bebe Model is was an early face Brew Bebe on a fully articulated wooden body, and that's what she has. And there are two of these in the Margaret Lumia collection. So. You can see that the dowel has dowel jointing at all of her limbs, um, completely made of wood, and makes it um, a wonderful dowel for posing and for uh, different uh, expressions. The Bebe Gourmand, one of the rarest of the brew bebés. Um, not, I guess I could see this again falls in the category of what was he thinking? Why would a child play with this doll, and how perishable could this doll be? Well, either it never took off and was successful because of that very fact, or it really was perishable, because so few of these dolls are, are able to be found today. The whole idea of the doll was that, that you, 
I, it's, it's just so hard to describe. Her tongue would come out. You would put a little biscuit on her tongue. The biscuit would go back in her mouth. There are metal tubes inside the body. The biscuit would fall through the metal tubes, and she has shoes on now, so you can't see it, but the bottom of her feet are hollow, and the biscuit would fall out the bottom of her feet. She was marketed as Bebe Gourmand, and luckily, we have, this doll has a couple things going for it, which are so great. She's so rare, and she's so beautiful, and I love her antique costume. Now, Brew was one of the first firms who really worked to create dolls um, probably for the burgeoning exotic travelers that were coming to Paris for the great exhibitions of 1868 and 1878. And here are two of his uh, Brew Bebes, and I think they're interesting because you can see the variation in complexion tones that he did on them. I'm particularly enamored with this example. I think she's absolutely stunning. Um, <laughs> I showed this catalog to someone yesterday and I said, go through the catalog. They weren't a doll collector. And I said, just tell me, if you were a doll collector and you were going to buy a doll, what doll is speaking to you that you'd buy? And she immediately chose this doll. It is the black complexion, black or brown complexion, Bebe's by Brew, do not always have this very gentle, desirable face. This one does. And everything about her is just so absolutely absolutely perfect and those splendid eyes with those deep deep brown coloring I'll turn around so you can see the back of her hair the back of her head and I think this hat as I recall has an original label in it the Moscow beaver dolls hat so I don't know what that is but that's the original label on the hat Oh, you're beautiful. And then this one, I, I love her complexion. It's just like a, a tawny golden color. Very, very, um, very lovely. And lavish costume with layers and layers of jewelry and necklaces and um, bracelets and earrings and wonderful bisque hands. The bisque hands, the same complexion as her face which is very desirable. So a beautiful collection of brews, and there are more brews than this in the collection. The German art character movement continues to be one of the most important um, categories of, of collecting in, among antique dolls today. It was very, very pivotal. It began about 1908 or 1909 in Germany, and many people credit Marion Collitz with her introduction of art character dolls. Her philosophy was, this was also true of Kathy Cruz, who was starting her dolls at the same time too, that children were playing with these beautiful, idealized, gorgeous French bebés, when really they should be playing with dolls that looked like themselves, that had expressions of children, that showed the different moods of childhood. So introduced her series, and this collection, the uh, Lumia Colle Landmark Collection, has, I believe, eight dolls from that very, very pivotal and famous Munich Art Fair exhibition in 1908 with the beginning of dolls that are credited for starting the art character movement. And here are an example on, over here of two of them from that, from that um, collection. Just absolutely wonderful. I have other dolls here, and we're just going to sweep across them and tell you briefly what they are. Gebruder Heubach, who had been making their wonderful uh, bisque piano babies figurines, also, kind of like when Jumeau decided, gee, I could take those Jumeau character heads for automatons and turn them into dolls, I sometimes think that Gebruder Heubach suddenly realized, gee, those faces that I'm putting on those bisque piano babies, I could make those into dolls, and that'd be another whole market. Because many of these same faces are what you would find on the bisque figurines that appeared. Here's a particularly notable doll, and I do want to turn him slightly because I want you to see the detail of sculpting on this doll. It's absolutely remarkable. Right down to the little fat roll on the back of his neck. I mean, they, this company didn't miss a trick. Their sculpting was so extraordinary. Truly works of art. And to find one in this size is quite, quite remarkable. Armin Marseille. Everyone thinks that Armin Marseille made simply um, dime story dolls, let's call them, but they also produced a remarkable series of art character dolls, 
with painted eyes, and this is a very good example of one, an extremely mirror, where not marked with a model number, just marked with her initials, A, M, and her size number, um, but very, very artfully done. Another one of the exa wonderful examples by Gebruder Heubach that we just talked about, and I turn it around so you can see the sculpted braids at the back of her head. The sculpting goes all the way around, not just a front view. And if you look closely at the sculpting on her cheeks and around her mouth, you see how it almost has the appearance of being hand-pressed. It's so well, well-defined. Another example in a smaller size of the Gebruder Heubach girl is down here, notable for a sculpted loop, which you then would put a hair ribbon through so you could change the color of the hair on the doll, as opposed to the other example that had the sculpted, sculpted and painted blue hair ribbon. And an older child, and I'll turn it around so you can see her little finger curls all the way around the back of her head. I love that little loop. I'm going to put it like this so you can maybe see it a little better. She doesn't trust anybody. She's looking kind of suspiciously. And then we have other examples. We have the little boy known by collectors as Little Duke. And if anyone can tell me how that nickname started for this doll, I would love to know but he is affectionately known as the Little Duke and very, very rare. Another wonderful example by Gebruder Heubach is this girl with light brown or ash blonde hair, as you would call it. And again, I just keep pointing this out about them, but these dolls have almost, it's almost as if each piece was hand sculpted by itself. I know they weren't, but they just don't look like something that was poured into a mold. They look like a complete unique piece of hand sculpting, very, very rare. We have our other wonderful um, character boy over here with a pouty face. We have another here with the blonde hair. We have a little girl by, um, by the Swain and Company who also made Lori, but this is an example. You never, never see this model. A very rare and a wonderful expression. The beloved Simon Halbig 1388 lady doll with her. This girl means a good time. Let me tell you, she's full of fun. And she's got a wonderful expression, deep sculpting, beautifully done. And finally, the, among the rarest of the art character dolls is the, the Cameron Reinhardt sculpted hair boy. And I'm going to show you his model number is 102. I'm going to show you the back of his hair as well. There's the profile. Among the rarest of the art character models. And this example, really superb. Many of these pieces we've been able to um, know because of auction catalogs where they were purchased either by, from ourselves or from other firms. And we've been able to have documentation of where they were purchased. So we've included that in the catalog. So collectors who now will own the dolls will have perhaps not the entire life story of every doll, but a good part of it. And those are some of the superb uh, character dolls from the Landmark Collection.